as I get my stuff together here. Um, when John uh, came to me and asked me if I would preach for him while I was away, if I was okay with that, I told him that it was no big deal. It's really just a bigger version of the children's sermon with fewer, fewer props. So I hope you guys are, are ready for that. But another question that he had for me um, when I was getting ready was how I was going to preach and whether that was going to be um, on a particular topic or if I wanted to preach um, from a particular passage. And then I told him that he couldn't take us all the way to the end of First Peter and then leave us hanging for two weeks. So I was going to carry us the rest of the way there. Um, since John has been our pastor here, it has uh, really changed the way uh, that I read the Bible and and how I look at scripture. I remember the first time that he said he was going to preach on the book of Jonah, and he said it was going to take six weeks, and I thought to myself, well, how many different ways can I tell the, the giant fish story in the, to the kids in the children's sermon? Um, but uh, what I, I really had no idea uh, how he was going to be able to take one of the, the shortest books of the Bible and then, and then stretch it out for such a long period of time. And it's because that every line of scripture is so um, very powerful. Um, I used to read the scriptures like a book, like a story, just read it end to end um, without ever really letting the, the meaning of a particular line of scripture really sink in the way that it can when you, um, uh, you, you study it. Every, every verse in the Bible um, is a story within a story. Every verse has its, its own meaning and it's like a, a layer of understanding um, that you get to peel back deeper and deeper. Uh, and that's all, all part of the adventure when you approach it that way. Um, and now when I read uh, scripture and when I was preparing for this sermon, um, I'll take a particular verse and I'll, and I'll ask myself a couple questions like what was, um, what was it saying to people when it was written then? What does it say to people now? And what does this particular scripture say to me personally or individually. And um, as I was doing that, um, I, want to, I want to share some personal struggles that I went through this week. Um, there, are, there are people out there uh, that would never believe that I would, that I would actually be up here today. Um, there are people out there that, that would never know that I went to church or that I am a, a, a believer in Christ. And there are people out there that do know those things and they would probably consider me one of the, the bigger hypocrites that they've ever known. Um, I, in my life, am no real example for how to deal with temptation. And I don't have any more answers um, than the next guy. I know that I uh, will give in to temptation uh, at some point again and it's probably gonna be sooner rather than later. Um, I'm ashamed of that because I felt like the Lord deserves a, a better vessel than what I am or that what I have to give. Um, and it's for a few reasons. I fear that, that my shortcomings might taint the message in some people's eyes that um, I'm afraid of um, that my failures would um, diminish it in some way. But by studying the scriptures the way that I have this week, um, I found some wisdom that makes all of those shortcomings easier for me to swallow. And that's how I tried to approach this sermon this week, and I pray that something here um, would speak to you where you are today as well. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says... Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, in the Old Testament reading, we heard Satan himself um, admit to this in Job around uh, 2,000 years before Peter. In uh, Job chapter 1, verse 7, the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. And here we stand another 2,000 years later and uh, not much has changed. 
Um, there is a, a great movie that I love um, starring Russell Crowe. It's called A Beautiful Mind. And A Beautiful Mind is um, a story of, <clears throat> excuse me, of John Nash, who was a, um, a Nobel laureate in economics. But um, uh, the story begins with uh, Nash's days as a graduate student when he was at uh, Princeton University. Now, early in the film, Nash is in his uh, 20s and his 30s, and he develops paranoid schizophrenia, and he suffers from terrible delusions. He suffers from really vivid um, hallucinations. And three of the uh, primary characters that make up his hallucinations are a college roommate, an imaginary college roommate, uh, a little girl who I'm pretty, I believe was the um, roommate's niece, and then a, um, a CIA agent. It's always with the CIA. Um, and eventually, um, Nash learns to uh, control his delusions and control his visions. So all his life, he has to go through um, uh, management therapies, and he has to go through medications, he has to, he has to practice mindfulness. And then, um, at the end of the movie, if you haven't seen it, I'm sorry, it's, it's an older movie, so I'm going to spoil it for you anyway. Uh, at the end of the movie, he's in his 70s, and he's, so it's been 30 or 40 years that he's, been, that he's been dealing with and managing these hallucinations, and he's accepting his Nobel Prize, and uh, he meets with his wife in the lobby, and uh, he gives her a hug, and he looks over in the corner of the lobby, and he sees the three characters standing there. He sees the girl, he sees the roommate, and he sees the CIA agent. Um, no matter what he does, no matter how much mindfulness he practices, no matter uh, how much he, he, he works at it, the visions never leave him. They're, they're always there with him. Um, they're always going to be there with him. And he just has to learn how to, to deal with them and resist them. And that's how it is um, with Satan and temptation in our lives. Try as we might to live a perfect life, um, the certainty of temptation is always lurking. It's always crouching. It's always prowling. Uh, it's always there with us. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So the poet in me loves this imagery because um, you've all seen the Discovery Channel where the, the lions are in the Sahara and they're taking down the gazelle. Um, the poor gazelle is just standing there blissfully ignorant, sipping water at the watering hole and um, completely oblivious to the, uh, the, the mortal danger that's, that's bearing down on it with, with laser-like focus and, and single-minded determination. And then everything happens so fast that the, um, the gazelle barely knows uh, what happens to it and has little or no time uh, to react. And you'll also notice that in, when, when Peter's talking about this, that he makes no separation of, of major and minor sins in the lion imagery. He doesn't say that, that Satan is plotting for, for major temptations in your life. Now, there may be some great and obvious temptations that you're going to have to deal with, um, reg regardless of um, whether or not you're going to be able to stop yourself. It's going to be the kind of thing that you can, you can see from a mile away. And you'll know what's happening when it's happening. But he also comes at you in very subtle ways. Um, some of them are going to be so subtle, so sly, and, and so deceitful that you won't even know that you're involved in them. Uh, you could even go through them and be done with them and not even know that you were there. Um, oftentimes you're ensnared uh, long and, and deep before you even realize what's going on. But... Um, Peter doesn't let us be helpless. We don't get to use that as an excuse. Uh, we get our warning in the beginning of verse 8. He says, be alert and be of sober mind. That is your warning. Uh, in verse 9, he gives us this command again, but this time he includes some words of encouragement. And in verse 9 he says, resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of suffering. It's always tempting to believe that when you're going through something or that you're going through um, when you're struggling with something, um, that you're all alone. Um, and we say things like, you don't understand, or nobody gets it, or nobody knows what it's like when you're dealing with things like um, pain or heartache or confusion or depression. 
And one strong suggestion that always comes up when these types of things happen is support groups. And these are uh, groups of people who have the same types of problems. Um, they get together and they, they share experiences with each other. They know how each other feels and they all speak the same type of lingo. And people are able to identify with each other and it makes it easier to cope with things. In uh, verse 9, Peter is, is telling us that we're not alone. When you're struggling to stand firm and resist temptation in a world that bombards you with it, there is somewhere that you can turn. You have your own support group, and it's your brothers and sisters in Christian faith, hope, and love. Peter tells you that Christians all over the world are going through the same type of suffering um, that you are. And it may vary uh, in the degree of pain that's involved or the, the degree of personal struggle that's involved. But if you're actively trying to resist temptation, if you're actively trying to resist Satan uh, and the temptations of this world, then you are going to suffer. In Peter's day, he's letting his readers know that Christian persecution was not limited just to them uh, in Asia Minor. Christians were persecuted pretty much everywhere that the good news about um, about Jesus Christ and the gospel were preached. And he reminds his readers of this um, to console them and to encourage them to emulate those who had successfully uh, endured the test of suffering. Um, thankfully, we're not told to do this without being given some kind of guidance on how to do it. Uh, we got the best example uh, from the greatest teacher of all in today's New Testament reading and what I was doing with the kids in the children's sermon today. Uh, Christ's example for dealing with temptation at any point in your life, some of the strongest temptations that you're going to, to be tempted with or that you're going to have to go through, are all covered in the Bible. Um, everything that you will ever need uh, is written there. It's not up to us um, to just wing it. And another place that you find um, instruction and encouragement about this is uh, from Paul in Ephesians um, chapter 6, verses 11 through 13. This is actually another VBS plug I didn't even plan on, so you're welcome. Um, in uh, verse 11, he says, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. Suffering is not pleasant, not at all. But you have the grace and love of Jesus Christ. You have the word of God and you've got the counsel of the saints to help you endure it. When the devil comes and wants to drive you into melancholy because of your sin, just take hold of the word of God, which promises forgiveness of sins, and rely on it. Now hear what Peter has to say in verses 10 and 11. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Sufferings on this earth, while sometimes appearing to be endless, are in fact only temporary and momentary when compared with the glorious eternity that believers get to spend with God um, in heaven. So a few weeks ago, uh, during the children's sermon, I held up a stopwatch and I asked the kids to blurt out and scream out all the, the foods that they could name um, that they love to eat right off the top of their head. And in the beginning, it was pizza and ice cream and cheeseburgers and candy and uh, all this stuff. Uh, but then it stopped. They, I guess they just ran out. But we still had 40 seconds left to go. And then it was still 30 seconds and still nothing. And then it was 20 seconds. And eventually, I just stopped the stopwatch because I felt like it was taking forever. Um, time is remarkably relative when you're enduring suffering, that time seems to slow to a crawl. And I wonder if there have ever been times in your life when it felt like the suffering was never going to end, even to the point of, 
uh, physical manifestation where your, your stomach hurt, your head hurt, your body ached, um, you didn't want to move, you felt trapped by your house. I've got some bad news, but I've also got some good news. The bad news is that's exactly what we're being prepped for in a passage like this from Peter. Um, Peter admits that living out a godly life and sharing the gospel message is not going to be easy. You are going to suffer for it. Um, I pray and I hope that it doesn't cost you a martyr's death, but it may cost you, um, it may cost you a friend, it may cost you um, a family member, there's a chance that it could cost you your popularity, it may cost you your pride. Um, in some cases, it may cost you social standing. Uh, in some cases, it may cost you a job. Those are um, trials and sufferings, and that is pain that is endured for the gospel, and it will feel endless. But the second half of the verse promises good news, and that good news is that God is going to restore you, support you, and strengthen you. God is going to set you on a firm foundation. And here's what Paul had to say in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10 on that. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Now, I have to confess here that I envy um, Paul's passion, and I wish I could say that I'm as Holy is committed to sharing the gospel as somebody like Paul, and I really wish that I could be. But a lot of times my pride gets the best of me. Um, fear gets the best of me. I let Satan tell me that I'm, that I'm too full of sin um, to be any kind of representative of God's righteousness. Unfortunately, that's true. But, thank God, it's not about you and me. It's about the grace, love, and mercy we have through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We don't actually have to do anything but let the Holy Spirit work through us and speak through us. We just have to let God use us. We just have to point to the scriptures and let other people know that the answer is in there. Jesus Christ is in there. We just have to endure. Endure for now, for this moment in time, and believe that God will restore, support, and strengthen us through it all. In chapter, or excuse me, in verse 12, uh, Paul gives his uh, final greetings. With the help of Silas, who I, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. <clears throat> uh, his final command in the letter is to greet one another with a kiss of love. Now, I also have another translation that translates this as Christian love. And one of the things I love about our church is this is something we do every Sunday as a part of our service uh, when we stand up and, and pass the peace. It is also uh, my daughter's favorite part of the sermon for, or favorite part of the service for two reasons. Um, one is they know that the children's sermon is coming up next and that the nursery comes after that. Uh, the second one is because they get to run up into the choir and hug about a dozen necks back there. But this part of the service is, is more than going up to each other and just saying things like, how was your weekend or how is the family? That kind of thing is for the um, coffee table and for the refreshments table after, for the gathering table. Um, this is actually, it's a biblical part of worship where we get to share the love of Christ with each other and greet each other in Christian love as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. So in closing, Satan, sin, and temptation never rest, so you can't either. Stand firm, but not by your own power. By the true grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Rest in the support and strength of the family of believers, your Christian brothers and sisters, and offer that support to one another and greet each other in Christian love. 
To God be the glory. Amen.